listening to the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Radio's authority on the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. Celebrating 25 years of broadcasting. Broadcasting around the world and to the great beyond. The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All Hit Radio Welcome to the X-Zone A place where fact is fiction And fiction is reality Now, here's your host, Rob Vicano And welcome back to the Exxon, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell. We're coming to you on the Mutual Broadcast Network, the Talkstar Radio Network, and the Exxon Broadcast Network. You can always send me an email, exxon at exxonradiotv.com, on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV, and our radio website, where you can find out what we've done in the past, what we're doing today, as well as for past shows that we've done. And where we intend on being tomorrow at www.exoneradio.com. Don't forget, Exxon Nation, you can always go to www.exontv.com and watch the first season of the Exxon TV show with our compliments. Once again, that's www.exontv.com. My guest this hour is Paul Davids. He is an author, artist, and award winning Hollywood filmmaker. As an author, his most recent book is the ambitious 514-page nonfiction, An Atheist in Heaven, The Ultimate Evidence for Life After Death. It is co-authored by Professor Gary E. Schwartz, Ph.D., a scientist who is also a prolific author. In 1990, Lucas Films contracted Paul Davids to co-write with his wife, six Star Wars books uh, that continue the Star Wars saga beyond the Return of the Jedi. Now, we're going to be talking to Paul this hour about his book, An Atheist in Heaven, The Ultimate Evidence for Life After Death. And Paul Davids, welcome back to the Exxon. Good having you back with us, Paul. Thank you, Rob. I remember a few years ago we had a conversation, and uh, this seemed like a 
good time to uh, come on back to talk about the new book. Well, congratulations on all your work, Paul, as a filmmaker, an award-winning filmmaker, an author, an artist, and, and so much more. So congratulations to you and, and to Gary on this great book. Thank you. You know, a lot of your listeners may uh, know me best, perhaps, for the Showtime movie Roswell. Yes. Uh, sort of a classic now. And, uh, we did that with um, Kyle MacLachlan and Martin Sheen and told the Roswell story the way we thought it deserved to be um, put across as a, a very uh, effective drama about that UFO crash in 1947. And no one can convince me otherwise. I don't know about you. <laughs> well, with me, the jury's still out. I'll be very honest okay. with you. The jury is okay. still out. Uh, I enjoyed the series that you did. I watched it. And when it comes to my own personal belief in Roswell, my entire outlook on the Roswell case is focused on Jesse Marcel. Because he did mm -hmm. something that makes no sense, and not very many people have ever talked about it. That's the fact that he went out to Mark Brazel's ranch, gathered some of the debris, and instead of maintaining the chain of custody of whatever this was and going right back to the base he did something that blew my mind and and to every military person i've ever talked to they can't understand the actions either he went to his house woke up his child woke up his wife and let them tamper with the evidence yeah you know uh, uh, what you say is true but my understanding is it was four in the morning after a long drive back from the sticks where this thing was, mm -hmm. and he had uh, a lot of the materials in his Jeep. <clears throat> so he went home for a brief night's sleep before reporting to the base early in the morning. So I, I think it wasn't uh, so far-fetched. He felt well, that it was uh, but, a really extraordinary thing that happened to him. But still, but still, having been a police officer myself and a criminal investigator, I know how important that chain of custody of evidence is. And what it tells me is that, as the base intelligence officer, if he would have kept the material in his vehicle under lock and key, that's one thing. But to allow civilians tamper with evidence right then and there, in my opinion, the entire Roswell story goes out the window. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I think there's a lot more to it than that, Rob, but uh, uh, I think we agreed that we were here to talk about another yep. uh, case that... Uh, and we're going to talk about that tonight. case when we come back from this commercial break. Exxon Nation, Paul Davids is our guest for this hour. He, along with Gary Schwartz, wrote a book, An Atheist in Heaven. And we're going to be talking to Paul on the other side of this break as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. Afterlife expert Roberta Grimes was the first one to say that dying can be fun. Now her best-selling book, The Fun of Dying, is available in stores worldwide. So if you wonder whether death ends life, how it feels to die, or what heaven might be like, The Fun of Dying was written for you. And if you have always been afraid of death, or if you worry that your life has no meaning, let The Fun of Dying ease your fears and bring new meaning to your life. Nothing said in The Fun of Dying is based on the teachings of any religion. Instead, Roberta draws on evidence to explain how death happens, how it feels, and what comes next. A lot of the best death-related evidence was produced in the first half of the 20th century. When it is put together with recent discoveries, it tells a consistent and amazing story. Roberta Grimes blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. Her wonderful book, The Fun of Dying, is available on Amazon and at stores worldwide wherever books are sold. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net.
While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Wilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we will weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Wilda Wiaka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. Star began to demonstrate a metaphysical connection to the spirit world as a little girl. Her family noticed the connection, but it was a great-grandmother who told the family that Linnea was indeed gifted. The great-grandmother, who was also gifted, felt that Linnea had indeed inherited these attributes. It has been noticed that oftentimes, such things are passed down through the generations. Linnea was also born with a call, a thin white membrane across a newborn's face. Legend has it that if the baby is born with this call, the child will have second sight, or what we call psychic abilities. Linnea Starr does past, present, and future, and has the gift of prophecy. It is written within scriptures that if you are able to give factual information, and prophecies indeed come true, the gift indeed comes from the divine realm. Linnea Starr does large interactive groups as well as private gatherings. For more information on Linnea Star or to contact Linnea for a one-on-one consultation, visit her website at www.linneastar.com. That's www.l-i-n-n-e-a-s-t-a-r.com. Exonation, Paul Davids is our guest uh, this hour. We're going to be talking to Paul about his new book, An Atheist in Heaven, The Ultimate Evidence for Life After Death. And if you'd like more information on Paul, here's two websites, lifeafterdeathproject.com and pauldavids-artist.com. What was the inspiration for writing An Atheist in Heaven, Paul? Well, Rob, usually a... uh book comes first and then comes a movie Mm -hmm. but in this case i had made a documentary film in was released in 2013 begun in 2009 about the very very bizarre things that began happening after the death of my mentor at age 92 uh, someone i admired greatly who was very famous in the world of science fiction forrest j ackerman um Fari was the atheist that we're referring to in An Atheist in Heaven. <clears throat> he didn't believe in religion, God, afterlife, ESP, paranormal, ghosts, a long, long list. And yet he was an editor of a very popular magazine called Famous Monsters of Filmland, which dealt with uh, movies about all of those things that uh, you know go bump in the night. And whether it's flying saucers or ghosts or spooks or mummies or the undead they were all in his magazine but to him it was always fiction uh as he i met him when i was 13 uh and uh, i was a fan of his as a kid he influenced me in going into a career in movies we were close for decades and as uh, the end of his life approached i uh, sort of challenged him about his insistence and in his uh position of atheism and said um you know, as far as life after death goes, are you so sure? You know, what What if you're wrong? Mm-hmm. And Fari's reply was, well, I doubt very, very seriously that I'm wrong. But if I do 
wake up to some great science fiction convention in the sky. Uh, he said, I'll, I'll give your regards to Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi and all the other horror actors that we've known and loved. Um, and he says, when the party dies down, maybe I would drop you a line and don't count on it. Right. So that <laughs> he said that to me. And he also put that in writing in his final statement uh, that uh, he he said again, published in uh, Famous Monsters posthumously. Uh, I'm an atheist. <clears throat> don't believe in life after death. If I'm wrong, I'll give your regards to. And then he gave a long list of deceased uh, actors and producers. So then when he passed December 2008, <clears throat> we planned a tribute that took place a few months later. Uh, his caretaker and best pal for the end of his life, Joe Mo, uh, really did most of the planning, I think, for that event at the Egyptian Theater in Hollywood. Uh, great tribute. You know, maybe a thousand people came. And top speakers, were the, Ray Bradbury spoke, and uh, Guillermo del Toro, and John Landis, and Peter Jackson even checked in from New Zealand. And I was one of the speakers. And they showed a movie that was a documentary of his life. <clears throat> that was the weekend that the strangeness started. <clears throat> Excuse me. It, it ended. I uh, first heard about an incident that happened to the filmmakers that had done a bio on him, that had wrapped, gone to his crypt that afternoon, wrapped on his crypt to say hello, and said they heard from him within the hour on their computers. They told me the whole story. It was bizarre, but very credible the way they told it. There were two computers involved. There was a voice. There was a capture code with Ackerman's name. So I sort of filed it away, but within a week, it happened to me. <clears throat> it was the first of many incidents. And you talked about evidence and the importance of chain of custody. It was a good point you made mm -hmm. at the beginning when we talked about Roswell. In this case, I had physical evidence of something impossible that happened in my house, that a change in a document that I had custody of while I was out of the room alone in a house and for I was out of room for five minutes and the document was changed when I came back it was a shock I I was really shocked because the the change was it was a blackout obliteration of certain words and it was done so neatly and precisely it immediately looked like it was intentional, a message. I was just frightened and scared. Uh, I did not see any possible way it could have happened. But I protected that evidence. I didn't touch it. Uh, it ended up in a clear Ziploc bag. Mm -hmm. And within a number of weeks, I was on my way to University of Indiana, uh, Indiana Purdue University, Indianapolis, head of the chemistry department, undertook an investigation of the chemistry. He began it there, involved other scientists. It went on for three years, and it left a lot of baffled chemists who were then spooked by poltergeist activity themselves. That's the way it all started with, and it became a movie, The Life After Death Project. Now, you asked about the book. The book followed the film because academics said, look, you've got scientific reports. You've got so much evidence. You've got a hundred incidents that have happened since that first incident. In order to really take it seriously, we need to see it in a book, include the scientific reports, uh, have chapters by the scientists that investigated it. Uh, let us have a glossary of all your incidents so that it can be taken seriously in the academic community by scientists who normally ignore this stuff. That's how it came to pass that I got together with Gary Schwartz to write An Atheist in Heaven. And it just came out last month. Gary, uh, Gary gives a warning in his preference to your book. Now, that's yeah. rather unusual. Uh, what is his warning? And what is he implying? His warning is that everything that you're going to read in this book is true. Mm -hmm. It's going to seem like fiction. You're going to seem like you're Alice going down the rabbit hole. But... He's saying, I vetted this man, Paul Davids. I vetted these events. I studied the events, even in my laboratory, and they began happening to me. And I know Davids is telling the truth and that this is real. So fasten your seatbelt and get ready. That's his, his, his warning. <clears throat> Leave your, your total skepticism and disbelief aside. 
while you venture where we've gone <clears throat> and see if we haven't put the case together. So not only did we have his preface at the beginning mm -hmm. where he explained, look, as a university professor at uh, University of Arizona, Tucson, as a professor who has a Ph.D. from Harvard, who taught at Yale, <clears throat> who studied paranormal life after death um, contact, after death communication. He studied it for 15 years. He studied mediums. He's used computers to do instrumental transcommunication with the deceased. He said, I can't afford <clears throat> to get wrapped into a case that might be false. And I was skeptical when I heard about it first. I put Paul Davids through the ringer. You know, he's a Hollywood producer. He's done some fiction. He wrote some Star Wars books. But the thing is here, Rob, I wrote a and I signed an affidavit that I wrote. It's at the beginning of the book where I swear that my account is true. My purpose was for science, for discovery, to set the record straight for my fellow man that there really is evidence that there are spirits that we go on after we die and that it can be proven. <clears throat> so that's that's how it began. That's how it all came about. For those of us who have long pondered the mystery of life after death, Paul, and especially the topic whether communication is just possible from deceased to the living, what we what will we find in your book that we haven't found in others? You're going to find a very specific compilation of evidence from different fields of knowledge, all pointing specifically toward the survival of the personality, the consciousness, the intelligence of my friend Forrest J. Ackerman, who was like the founding godfather of science fiction in this country in movies and books. Um, when I say <clears throat> it's different than what you found before, there are books that talk about near-death experience. We're not talking about that here. There are other books about reincarnation. Go to those books if you want to study reincarnation. We... Uh, use all the evidence that happened since Fari's death of instrumental transcommunication, meaning communication through computers, videotapes, uh, electronic voice phenomena that they call EVP. We've used the very best mediums that Gary has studied in his laboratory for years and has found to be credible. We've compiled a massive number of synchronicities that are just impossible events that point to and connect Forrest J. Ackerman as being involved, almost like a, <clears throat> excuse me, an unseen mm -hmm. prankster. And then perhaps most compelling of it all are the physical phenomena that have taken place. I'm talking about things like apports, disappearances of objects, appearances of objects, uh, the ink that I talked about, the yes. ink message. Um, there was an ink incident in Fate magazine that shouldn't have happened that related directly to this case. There's such a long list. And one other point, Rob, uh, that uh, the king skeptic in America, Dr. Michael Shermer, he said in one of his uh, articles, I think it was in Scientific American, that it is the consilience of evidence from different fields, all pointing toward one conclusion, that brings us advancement in science. And the, the point Gary and I are making is exactly that, that what we have here is a consilience of evidence from all these different fields, and in science, especially chemistry, with the study on the, the ink obliteration, that all point toward the same thing. So that's what we're offering, and that's why I spent three years, 515 pages with Gary, putting it all together. And you can find it at Amazon, by the way. It just came out a month ago, and it's it's a hardback, mm -hmm. and it's an ebook. Somebody wants it, you know, for a Kindle. Stand by. We've got to take our news break at the bottom of the hour. Exo Nation. Paul Davids is our special guest. We're talking about uh, Paul's new book that is co-written by. Paul and uh, Dr. Gary Schwartz. The book is entitled, do you have your pencils and paper ready, Exo Nation? An Atheist in Heaven, The Ultimate Evidence for Life After Death. And um, if you'd like to find out more about the book, 
go to www.lifeafterdeathproject.com. That's www.lifeafterdeathproject.com. And you can also find out more about Paul Davids at his website, www.pauldavids-artist.com. That's Paul David, that's with an S, davids-artist.com. We'll be back on the other side of this break with the news as we continue here in the Exome from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Thomas Jefferson was a Burgess of 27 when he met Martha Whale Skelton, a 22-year-old widowed heiress who was fondly called Patty by her family. They were married on January the 1st, 1772, and they took up residence in a cabin on the building site on top of a Virginia mountain that Thomas had named Monticello. As Thomas and Patty slowly built their first version of the great house at Monticello, the Revolutionary War was heating up. Patty, with difficulty, bore five children, but only two girls survived. Thomas's political career developed to the point where he was often away from home, but after he authored and signed the Declaration of Independence in Philadelphia, he resolved never again to leave his wife. He was elected the governor of Virginia, just as that state became the revolution's last battleground. The Revolutionary War ended in 1781, and Thomas gladly retired altogether to my family, my farm, and my books. But Patty continued to want to bear her treasured husband a son, and late in the summer of 1782, she died of kidney failure at the age of 33, four months after having borne yet another girl. Thomas was so devastated by her death that he never remarried. He mourned her for the rest of his life, even as he helped to frame the peace in France and then became the first Secretary of State, the second Vice President, and the third President of the United States. This story is true. Thomas Jefferson was such an obsessive letter writer and record keeper that we know where he was and what he was doing nearly every day of his adult life. Every significant thing he says in My Thomas comes from his contemporary writings. My Thomas by Roberta Grimes is now available at Barnes & Noble, Costco, Target, Books A Million, Hudson Booksellers, Kmart, Walmart, Sam's Club, Walgreens, CVS, and online at Amazon.com. You can visit Roberta Grimes online at www.robertagrimes.com. <laughs> The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. 
Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Unwilling to be the government's deadly assassin, gifted psychic Kahara Mitchell went AWOL and ended up buried under rubble in the wake of a great tsunami. She regained consciousness far from Earth on the medical ship of a Dagaronian intergalactic fleet. Has she been rescued or abducted by aliens? The Chalice of Carrie, Kahira O'Donnell's latest paranormal science fiction romance, is the passionate story of an Earth woman and her destined mates, twin kings from another galaxy. Kahara uses her gifts fighting alongside Lords Rom and Ra in a war that will determine the destiny of galaxies. The Chalice of Kari by Kahira O'Donnell is now available at kahiraodonnell.com or at amazon.com. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. What Happened in Benghazi is revealed by Nicholas Genix, author of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. He informs the American people that President Obama deceived them by advocating a strong foreign policy prior to the 2012 presidential election, and Hillary Clinton supported this deception. As the title infers, there is a connection between Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. Ample evidence informs Americans that Obama's early indoctrination in the Quran developed an infinity for Islam, why the Quran is the source of discontent in many countries, and why the Obama foreign policy deception led to poor military action and caused the loss of American lives in Benghazi. Genix provides 36 questions for the Select Committee on Benghazi to validate if Americans are justified to mistrust President Obama and Hillary Clinton. An overview of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi is presented on the website www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Annie Callahan dedicated to negotiating a position for Earth within the Dagaronian coalition, had trained for three years to become an Earth ambassador. Yet, the very eve of her arrival at the capital ruling planet, she is claimed as destined mate to an oversized, mating maddened vamp who swears he will never release her. Lord Astaran, king of the Macian sector, has waited over 900 years for his destined mate, Having found her as an alpha vamp, he is unable to relinquish Annie, virtually holding her hostage until he can claim her. Yet Macians cannot survive without their mate's love. How could he strip her of her citizenship, her ambassadorship, and her freedom and expect to win her heart? With All That I Am by Kahira O'Donnell is the latest book in this exciting series, The Daggeronian Chronicles, guaranteed to keep readers coming back for more. With All That I Am by Kahira O'Donnell is available on Amazon.com and KahiraO'Donnell.com. Davids is our guest. We're talking about Paul's new book, An Atheist in Heaven. Paul, why do you think uh, Mr. Ackerman is trying so hard to make communications with so many people and providing so much evidence? That's a really good question, and it's one that I discussed with the great author Richard Matheson before he passed away. Um, You know, uh, Fari was a futurist. For him, the meaning of science fiction, which he promoted 
to bring it from the fringes into the mainstream through the decades. Uh, for him, science fiction pointed a way toward our future of a world that could come to pass. So when we think back to early Star Trek, for example, some of the devices that they had on Star Trek are, are now, have, we're for, you know, we have them. We have communicators. We have our cell phones that were science fiction. So many new inventions have changed our lives. And science fiction has always tried to be one step ahead of that. Now, Fari, uh, as this kind of a futurist visionary, I think would have set the record straight. He would have been the guy to do it. Richard Matheson agreed with me. You know Richard Matheson. He started out writing uh, Twilight Zones and The Incredible Shrinking Man. And uh, he, he wrote What Dreams May Come the movie with Robin Williams about afterlife. He knew Forrest J. Ackerman. He knew his sense of humor. And when he looked at all this evidence I brought to him to tell me his judgment, he said, you know, Fari is correcting himself. He's setting the record straight. Uh, he's uh, discovered he was wrong and he's letting you know. Mm -hmm. And he wants you to know and others to know. And he's finding whatever way he can to get your attention and do that. And I think that that's what's been happening. And I, I also get a sense of enjoyment on his side uh, because so many of these things that he's done raise a smile just as he always did when he was with us. He, he was always cracking a joke, uh, taking that frown on your face and turning it into a laugh. He was that kind of a personality. What about skepticism? What do skeptics say about what you have written about, you and Gary, in your book, um, how do they challenge you and how do you meet with their challenges? Well, it's a really great question, Rob. Um, because when I made the film Life After Death Project, mm -hmm. I went straight to the king of the skeptics. Now, I think um, maybe apart from the amazing Randy, you have to look to Dr. Michael Schirmer who runs, the, uh, he's executive director of the Skeptic Society in Altadena, California. Mm -hmm. And he's the publisher of Skeptic Magazine. Yeah. Now, I want to say that at the beginning of my book, I have an inscription to me that I've uh, reproduced there from Michael Shermer, uh, because after he saw the Life After Death project that he was in and expressed his points of view, he wrote to Paul, in respect of your honest search and integrity. I thought that was really important because the king of the skeptics is acknowledging that I've been honest in what I presented and attempted. It's been an honest search and undertaking and that I've done it with integrity. And that's the respect that I want to have coming from a person uh, that I really appreciate receiving from. Now, um, he started out in the film when he expressed his opinion um, first of all he could bring no theories to bear on any of the phenomena that we presented to him um, he couldn't explain the things mm -hmm. the scientists couldn't explain about the ink obliteration or any of the other incidents some of the extreme synchronicities he said law of large numbers probability you're going to have some coincidences in life all right but we had so many of them. And when you put it together with all the other data, he couldn't explain it. And he said, look, I'll put it in a gray basket. And he said, if it turns out one day that we find out that there is an afterlife, then um, it, it may be explained by something of quantum physics theory we don't understand right now. It won't be paranormal then. It'll be chapter 25 in your physics book. Right. Okay, fine. But... He couldn't bring any answers to the table, and what is really a kind of cosmic justice in, in, my, in my way of looking at it, he had an incident happen to him that was just like it, it was one of the incidents out of my book. It involved after death, what apparent after-death communication right on his wedding day. And he was so shocked by what happened to him that he wrote an article about it in... Um, his column for Scientific American, it was a September issue, I believe, about two years ago. And the title of his article was, When Something Happens That Shakes Your Skepticism to the Very Core. 
All right. So here's a guy who had regarded all this stuff intellectually for most of his life, and then he had something happen to him. That's what happens to a lot of us that sits around. In his case, it was his wedding. He, he married a German lady who was raised by her deceased her grandfather, who was then deceased. They shipped his things over. It, it included a broken transistor radio. Uh, Michael Shermer spent a lot of effort trying to fix that, you know, soldering gun, changing batteries, whatever he could do. He couldn't get it to work. But after they got their wedding license at City Hall and they came back to the house to greet friends and uh, uh, say their vows again in front of their friends, his wife said, you know, I feel kind of lo lonely so far from Germany here. I just wish my grandfather were here to uh, to give me away. Sure. And at that moment, the radio began playing a love song. It was stashed away in a drawer in their bedroom. They heard the music. They didn't know where it was coming from. And they tracked it down to grandfather's radio, started playing a love song. It kept working for 24 hours, and then it shut off, and it never worked again. So his, his bride said, you know, grand, my granddad was here, you know, to give me away. And what is Michael going to say? What is he going to conclude? I mean, as he said, it shook his skepticism to the very core. So the bottom line, Rob, is nobody has absolute answers for these kind of phenomena. And what seems to make sense to those who undergo these experiences is to come to the conclusion that they're hearing from people who have crossed over that they knew. It's not like being a ghost hunter going into a haunted house. You don't know what kind of spirits are there. You're a shot in the dark. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's someone I knew who's behaving like he knew, like like uh, I knew him when he was alive. And that's the way it is for so many who lose a parent, a uh, sister, a brother, a loved one, uh, a spouse, and then something happens that makes them feel like they're still in touch. It happens to... Maybe 50% of the people I talk to when working on this project. You know, skeptics and many scientists long ago, Paul, closed the doors on mediumship, seances, spiritualism, and, and a whole list of other things within the realm of the paranormal. Why should scientists open the door to these issues now? Well, because I think there's evidence that shows that they, the expression is throw out the baby with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Look, we all know that spiritualism and seances and mediums, they have a very mixed past. Yeah. There's been a lot of fraud. Uh, there's been deception, and some mm -hmm. of it is for financial gain. It's one of the things Harry Houdini objected to so much, he tried to get a law passed by Congress making uh, mediumship readings criminal uh, to accept money for something like this. Uh, even as a donation. So uh, skeptics and a lot of other people devoted to the sciences took a hardened position. But it's not just the work of Gary Schwartz, though that's the work I'm going to point to, but I think there has been a lot of work that shows that there are some people that do have the gift of mediumship. And I'm certainly convinced that those I worked with in this project delivered everything that I ever could have hoped for. Um, I filmed them. There were, there were three, one from Australia, Glennis Mackay, who was recommended by Whitley Strieber. Whitley Strieber. Uh, then there is Catherine Yunt in Tucson, who Gary has studied his experimentations on mediumship. And then there is an Israeli psychic named Orit, Orit Ish Yemeni Tamer. These people, particularly, let's say, Catherine Yunt and Orit, at the beginning, they didn't know who I was. They weren't told my name. I was just the guy who was showing up with a camera to film a reading. And they weren't given the full name of the person I wanted to communicate with. They were just told he wants to talk to a deceased friend named Forrest. Right. What followed, Rob, was... I mean, it was just incredible in terms of its accuracy, its specificity. These people were not briefed. It was not a cold reading. They were given nothing. 
and yet they came through. So I'm asking for uh, scientists who have an open mind about this to uh, join the investigation again and admit that there may have been an immense overreaction because of the uh, of the fraud that was experienced in the days of the spirituals. But there are those out there, Paul, who believe that we should leave the dead rest in peace, that we on this side of the veil have no business trying to to break the veil, to bring these two worlds together. How do you deal with that? Well, I think for people that feel that way, that that's fine for them. Mm -hmm. And I would say that for me, I didn't try to break the veil. I had no ambition to bring the worlds together. Mm -hmm. Things started happening after Forey Ackerman passed away. The initiative was on his side. He was coming to me and I was paying attention because he was teaching me things that I, I needed to, to know. Um, for those who uh, devote themselves obsessively to seances, to Ouija boards, who are always trying to communicate with some mm -hmm. spirit, they don't know what the, who the spirit is, uh, evil or, you know, they may know nothing about who they're trying to contact, particularly when they go into some dubious places. Well, that, you know, you can argue that's not a healthy way to live, not a healthy thing to do. But I, I think the key thing is for us to learn the reasons why it's reasonable for logical people to believe that life goes on after we die and that our deceased loved ones continue to exist and can still see into our world through us and communicate when me, they want to do it. Let me, ask, let me ask you this. There is a lot of charlatans in the paranormal, a lot. You know, yeah. the psychic 108 numbers... Uh, on so-called reality TV programs, these ghost shows, they're anything but real. They have put a bad taste in the mouth of John Q. Public. John Q. Public wants very little to do with that because they have been burned so many times before. How are you going to turn this around? Well, it's hard. It's just like it is with UFOs. People have been burned a lot of times. Um, so I respect that. I mean, to those people, I say, you know, nobody likes to be deceived mm -hmm. or, or used. Uh, I don't. But um, I think that I have a good chance of being heard here because I took the high road and I involved science in this investigation from the beginning. There are three universities that were involved in the research that got into, uh, went into an atheist in heaven. Um, and I found scientists were willing to delve into it. They experienced unusual phenomena as a result of being part of the studies. It changed their points of view. Uh, and I think to the extent that there's truth here and what I've worked to present in an atheist in heaven and the life after death project film uh that it will uh that it will be heard but I, that's why i'm talking to you robin on other shows too mm -hmm. to say there's a case here i don't like to be deceived by the false uh shows either all right so what about we've talked about the scientific arena we've talked about the paranormal arena let's bring this into the realm of theology what okay. does the religious aspect the religious uh, arena say about communicating with the dead? <laughs> That's a tough question. When you put it in terms of communicating with the dead, I think religion has, no matter the religion, I think almost all of them have always told us that there is an afterlife mm -hmm. and that we are, um, that there's a spiritual evolution, that we're not just our body, we're something mm -hmm. more, and that we go on. Now, in the opening cha uh, chapter or the preface of An Atheist in Heaven, Gary Schwartz talks a lot about heaven as we use the term in the broadest possible sense. You know, we're not trying to give a Christian definition of heaven. We're not talking about uh, whether there is or isn't a God. We, we don't ever address that question because we're just looking at evidence of survival of consciousness and interaction. But doesn't, the, but doesn't that... 
have a lot to do with the perception of how certain religious factions will look at your book, look at your evidence, look, even look at the scientific evidence? Well, we've chosen a title that's an oxymoron, you know, an atheist in heaven. Mm-hmm. The two things are a clash. They don't seem to go together. Although the Pope has made a statement now saying that it's possible that atheists uh, would be accepted into a Christian hedge, uh, heaven. So uh, he's opened the door there. He's opened a lot of doors. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I'm not trying to be religious mm-hmm. about it in the approach at all. Not at all. No, I, I, under, just, I understand that. You know, I, I understand that. But my question, there, there my question some, was, my question was based... people who, who, my... uh, who feel that it's that it's not where we should be focusing. For example, I made the film Jesus in India mm-hmm. about the missing years of Christ and yeah. the question, was he in India? And Ed Martin uh, wrote the book that that was based on, and he was raised as a fundamentalist. He went to church three times a week when he was a boy uh, in Texas. And you know, he was ostracized from his church for asking questions about those missing years. And when he latched on to the idea that maybe Edgar Casey was right, that Jesus spent years in India, he, he was, you know, tossed out. And they said, worry about your own salvation, not about that biblical mystery. Hey, listen, uh, Paul, we've got to take our final break. Please stand by. Exonation, Paul David. Davids is our special guest. He, along with uh, Gary Schwartz, have written a book, An Atheist in Heaven www.lifeafterdeathproject.com and www.pauldavids-artist.com We'll be back on the other side of this break as we wrap up this hour here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. Little children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at songsandstoriesforsoldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. You're listening to the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. If you enjoy reading a good mystery with a touch of the paranormal, then you'll love From Out of the Woodwork by William S. Peckham. Sean Kennedy, a Toronto contractor, buys derelict houses, guts them, and turns them into multifamily dwellings. When Sean buys 29 Livery Lane, a century house in ruins, and starts the renovation, the house fights back. He is visited by ghosts of owners past. His visions are triggered by touching an oak mantle, reading a faded letter, opening an old locket, or opening a brand new casket in the basement. These visions will take you on a trip across southern Ontario from Niagara Falls to Toronto to Kingston. 
from Out of the Woodwork is now available in paperback and on your favorite electronic reader. To order your copy of From Out of the Woodwork, go to www.williamspeckham.com. That's www.williamspeckham.com. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, on the Mutual Broadcast Network, Talkstar Radio Network, and Exxon Broadcast Network. Don't forget, Exxon Nation, uh, this coming Monday, May the 16th, our hours are changing. We will be live from 6 p.m. until 10 p.m. Eastern, Monday through Friday, and then three hours after the live show, the networks are repeating the Exxon in its entirety from 1 a.m. until 5 a.m. Monday through Friday, and then we're also played on the weekends. Paul Davids and uh, Gary Schwartz have written a book entitled An Atheist in Heaven. If you'd like more information, lifeafterdeathproject.com and pauldavids-artist.com. All right, Paul, you wanted to uh, just continue with what we were talking about. Yes, oh, and for those out of the country, uh, by the way, Rob, who are listening, who may wonder where can they get this hardback book, well, I do want them to know it's an ebook, very widely uh, distributed as an ebook. You can start with Amazon or find that almost anywhere. What I wanted to wrap up um, when I said that Ed Martin was uh, ostracized from mm-hmm. his fundamentalist church for asking the wrong questions uh, was Jesus in India during the missing years? And we made the film about it. We went to India. We spent six weeks crossing the country. We talked to uh, the Dalai Lama. We talked to the Pope of Hinduism, who's the Shankaracharya. We went to the Vatican and uh, interviewed Monsignor Corrado Balducci. But maybe best of all, I interviewed Elaine Pagels, the great biblical scholar of Princeton University, and she conceded in the interview that biblical scholarship cannot rule out the possibility that Jesus did go to India by the Silk Road during those mm-hmm. uh, missing years. They can't say it didn't happen. And to me, that vindicated Ed Martin in his quest, who'd been ostracized. So for the religious point of view that begins with such a closed mind, let's not go there. My religion tells me otherwise. I'm not going to look. Maybe sometimes that's preventing you from taking the next step toward, toward knowledge. There you go. I had a guest on earlier tonight who told me that anyone who who believes or practices communication with the other side or whether they believe in ghosts or whether they're shamans, whatever, they are part of the occult. So they and you know, he was a he was a staunch Baptist. So there's a lot of still resistance within certain religious philosophies to what you and I talk about all the time. Well, there's also resistance in book publishing because books of this kind, regardless of the amount of science I have here, a lot of chemistry that was very mm-hmm. challenging for top-level chemists, it gets classified under occult. You know, flying saucers get yeah. classified under occult when you're looking for something in a bookstore. So it's, you know, it's just something we have to work with. What does that mean anyway? Is, isn't the occult just a blanket term for the unknown to the darkness of the unknown yeah, and, exactly. and that causes fear in a lot of people and, and you so know if they don't want to go there they you know that's fine and you know it's because of authors like you and gary in my opinion the occult is not dark the occult is very bright the paranormal is very bright we just have to get people to start looking our way i think so i mean i think that the series of events that have happened to me in the last mm-hmm. six years since Vari died have been wonderful, delightful, life-transforming, and have given me a great hope. All right, Paul, I want to thank you so much, Paul. We've run out of time for tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Continued success. ExoNation, Paul Davids was my guest this hour. He is the author of An Atheist in Heaven, along with Dr. Gary E. Schwartz. LifeAfterDeathProject.com and PaulDavids-Artist.com. 
I'll be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Send me an email. Are you a believer or are you a skeptic? X-Zone at x TV.com. My name is Rob McConnell. This is the X-Zone. Don't go away. <music> 